Hi, welcome everybody. We're here to talk about metabolic health and health span. I'm Renee Dehan, and I'm Vice President of Artificial Intelligence and Science at Inside Tracker. Hi, I'm Louisa Nicola. I'm a neurophysiologist and founder of NeuroAthletics. Hi, I'm Kara Collier. I'm a registered dietitian, founder, and VP of Health at NutriSense. So metabolic health, metabolic dysfunction. Um, I think many people think that this just means diabetes, and it's just affecting this like smaller subset of the population. But it's estimated that 93% of the US population is not metabolically optimal. So they're not in an optimal state of metabolic health based off of the five criteria for metabolic health. You know, fasting glucose, HDL, triglycerides, waist circumference, and blood pressure. So when people wonder, you know, why is this important? Is this affecting me? Most likely the odds are that it is affecting you since only about 7% of us are in that place that would be considered really optimal. Yeah, it's scary. It right? is scary. I'm in the brain health and Alzheimer's disease states. And what we see is that we've got a huge epidemic right now of the amount of people who are getting diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And what we know from literature is that around 90% and I, I would say 95% of all cases of Alzheimer's disease are driven by lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And when you marry that with metabolic dysfunction, it, it's scary because it can be somewhat preventable, right? If we look yeah, at, you know, if we, if we take out genetic predispositions, what do we have? We have metabolic dysfunction. And then we look at, you just mentioned blood pressure. Blood pressure is uh, one of the biggest contributing factors to uh, vascular disease and vascular dementia. So. I think that's important too. So many people ask me, what is metabolic health? So I feel like metabolic health is starting to become a little bit of a buzzword, insulin resistance, you're hearing a little lot, um, but really defining what that means. To me, it's just the state of health that your metabolism is in. And your metabolism is just all of those complicated processes to turn food into usable energy. So a good analogy to think about this is a transportation system. So right now we're in New York City, you think about a really well run transportation system, has all of these different highways, they have all these different sidewalks, they have all these different bus trains and subway trains and all these lines that take you where you need to go. Right, it's really complicated, but when it works well, then it's extremely efficient. We're putting people where they need to be in the best, most efficient way possible. That's an optimal metabolic health, optimal metabolism, is we're eating the food we're eating or breaking down our own stores, and then we're putting it exactly where it needs to be in the most efficient way possible. Whereas metabolic dysfunction, or when you start to get into poor metabolic health, these systems start to break down and they don't run as well. So that's when you have construction all the time. And you're like, why is this road closed? And then you have potholes. And so you're having to take a side detour. And then you have you know, construction over there and issues over here. And suddenly nothing is going where it needs to go in an efficient manner. And that's essentially poor metabolic health. So if you can think about all the consequences that come with that, if our energy system, our food system isn't being regulated in a way that's optimal, then we're going to see immediate effects in how we feel, how we perform. Then we're also gonna see long-term effects in our weight, in our health status, and then it's gonna lead to an increased risk of various different chronic illnesses. So when you're defining metabolic health, what role does mitochondria play in that? Is that, what you, is that the, the warehouse itself? Yeah, I always think about, so essentially metabolism as a whole is kind of your cellular engine as like, if you're thinking about a car, you know, the yeah. engine runs everything. And then the mitochondria are kind of like an engine within your engine. So okay. they're like the mini batteries is how I think about it. So on a very small scale, the mitochondria are what's working at that individual level, but then you need all of it working together at a population level. So for your full metabolism, full metabolic health, they need to be, you know, interconnected and communicating well with each other. So then I guess the ones, the engines that become dysfunctional are due and driven by lifestyle. That's exactly right, yeah. So lack of sleep, lack of sunlight, poor quality in food, lack of exercise. And I would also um, say that environmental factors yes. as well. Yes, yeah, and stress. Stress all forms of stress, one. both yeah. psychological stressors, but also physical stressors like toxins in our environment, illness, injury, all of these things are going to impact the way that we're able to function. And then is it also the aging process? 
Unfortunately, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's one of those things that's a little less in our control, of course. Um, but there is, you know, those different habits that we have, our lifestyle factors can influence the rate at which we are aging. So one, one question I think would be good to just talk about is what is the relationship between glucose and insulin? Because we hear about those two biomarkers a lot with respect to metabolic health, um, and especially as it pertains to NutriSense um, and Inside Tracker yeah. and just general health that you health and well-being that you get when you go to the doctors, et cetera. Is that something that you can explain or kind of talk about for, for maybe a lay audience and its relationship to insulin sensitivity and why that's important? Yeah, absolutely. So I think about glucose as kind of the fuel system for that metabolic engine, right? It's a fuel, fuel source for our body. Whereas insulin is more like the traffic police officer that's kind of dictating where that energy goes. So insulin is a hormone, and what hormones do is they communicate signals. Um, and so, again, when we have a really well-oiled transportation machine, then we have good communication signals. All of our stoplights are working, stop signs make sense, all of those signals are directing things efficiently. And that's essentially what our hormones are doing. And then insulin is really specifically directing glucose, but it also kind of sends those signals to build, and it halts the signals to break down energy. So a lot of people think, you know, insulin is only influencing glucose, but it's also influencing the flow of fat and fatty acids and the flow of amino acids and protein and DNA. So it's essentially this um, communication signal to drive energy where it needs to be. And then glucose is kind of that, that energy source. And so by monitoring glucose, in my opinion, is kind of like being able to peel back the layer um, and look inside of the engine and see how it's functioning because you can see how is your body maintaining homeostasis, its normal baseline function, if you're not eating. We always have some glucose in our system. So how is our body en regulating energy levels when we're not giving it food? And then also, when we are eating, how is our body processing that? And that is kind of um, plays a role with how well that signal from insulin is functioning as well. Um, metabolic dysfunction or metabolic disease is really on a spectrum. It's not black and white, right? And it's like this with all conditions. You don't suddenly wake up one day with type 2 diabetes. It's this long spectrum of health that takes decades to develop. So in one extreme, maybe we have your super metabolically optimal. On the other extreme, we've gotten to the point of uh, metabolic dysfunction where we have type 2 diabetes and we no longer can partition fuel appropriately. And then in between then, you know, we have a long amount of time and differences where you can intervene with lifestyle factors. And with insulin, what tends to happen over time as we get towards metabolic dysfunction is that insulin levels rise, as you have probably seen with some of your patients, because um, it's kind of like the boy who cries wolf. Uh, at first, it's like, I'm going to keep yelling for insulin. I need that communication. I need that signal. And the body responds by giving more insulin, more insulin. But then over time, the body stops listening to that because we're yelling all the time. And that's where we see a lack of insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. The cells are no longer responding to that communication signal because it's just getting yelled at all the time. So it's not as important. Someone's yelling at yeah. you all the time. You're like, OK, I'm going to numb you out. And that's when we see insulin sensitivity start to decrease. And then that's when we've really gotten into metabolic dysfunction. And that's like with everything in biology. The, the analogy I like to you know, point out to people is, Glucose is, you know, the primary fuel for the brain. It's needed for ATP, energy production, okay? And there's only one real way to drive down glucose, and that's through insulin, which is a hormone. However, there are so many different ways that glucose can rise, you know, from stress, from norepinephrine, from growth hormone. There's so many things that can rise blood glucose levels, but there's only really one way to bring that down, and that's via insulin. Exactly. Yeah. Insulin, and then every once in a while you can bring it down with exercise, yeah. um, non-insulin dependent exercise, which is one of why I believe exercise is one of our most powerful tools in our toolbox. Um, even movement. I hate sometimes calling it exercise because yeah. for some people that's like, I have to go to the gym or I need to like do some hard boot camp. But any sort of movement kind of helps the body um, bring some of those down without needing as much insulin, which is really incredible. 
I think that's such a good, very, very important point too, um, because then it's not so onerous. Like you can always be moving, <laughs> always. Yeah. Like even when you don't think you can be moving, you can absolutely be moving. Like yeah, even sorry. fidgeting is some level yeah. of movement, but yeah, there are really like kind of silly ways to incorporate movement into your day. And we're so sedentary. And I feel like the sedentariness of culture has definitely impacted. I imagine it's impacted our metabolic health as absolutely. a population. Yeah. Actually, one thing I've actually noticed with wearing a CGM was my postprandial spikes. Mm. And I actually experiment on myself quite often. And if I see a rise in my glucose from, you know, whatever I eat, if I go out and maybe I do 20 box jump, jumps or maybe I do 50 squats or maybe I go for a quick sprint, I notice immediately that it will drive it back down mm -hmm. in a fast phase. But if I don't, it may rise and then drop, you know, after that. Yeah, absolutely. Like I have a desk job, so squeezing in, yeah, it can be yeah. silly and random. I'm sure you know how it is, yeah. but uh, you have back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings. If I'm about to sit for six hours straight, then I'm doing body squats in between. I'm turning my yeah. video off for five minutes while I like pace around really quickly. Uh, finding a way to squeeze it in makes a really big difference, yeah. just being kind of mindful of that. So let's talk about some of the chronic diseases that can occur if your blood glucose goes unchecked for too long. Um, we know about type 2 diabetes. I would love to talk about prediabetes. I think that's so important and probably affects a wider population than type 2 diabetes. Um, and specifically on prediabetes, I would also love to talk about how malleable it is. Like what, you know, how, how easy is it to use lifestyle factors to move yourself out of that space before having to go to heavy hitting drugs? Um, and then, of course, your area of expertise Alzheimer's, brain research, how does metabolic dysfunction really affect diseases of the brain? Um, but any other conditions that we should be talking about that are on this list that we haven't already measured or haven't already mentioned? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, yeah, cardiovascular disease yeah. is another big one that um, is really highly correlated with blood glucose values and metabolic health in general. Um, and we know that just having your average glucose levels rise, even in non-diabetic levels, we see a match stepwise increase in mortality risk. And so essentially average blood glucose levels can having them you know, increase over time can increase your risk of just about every major chronic condition that's associated then with mortality. So of course, we talked about diabetes, um, prediabetes, which as you mentioned, is estimated to be about 40% of the population, but many of which don't even know that they're prediabetic. Um, cardiovascular disease, including things like hypertension, stroke, heart attack, um, neurological conditions, so Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, Kidney disease, so chronic kidney disease is also associated with blood glucose levels. And many cancers are starting to have, we're learning more and more that there is a tight correlation there between many different cancers, with some in particular being an even higher correlation um, with blood glucose levels. And not just that, I think at the root cause of depression as well lies yeah, metabolic dysfunction. Um, when it comes to diabetes and prediabetes, something that I've seen in the literature is for every point over 85, you increase your risk of type 2 diabetes by 6%. Yeah, it's insane. And that brings a really good point that um, it's not just once we've crossed into the threshold of type 2 diabetes that we're seeing risks or seeing problems. Um, we know that you know, fasted glucose levels over 100 are considered that pre-diabetic range, but there are hundreds of research studies to indicate that those zones a little bit lower than that, we're seeing increased risk as well. And we're starting to see inflammation and signs of insulin resistance and what you could consider almost pre-pre-diabetes. Mm. Um, so it's important to really think about what's the reference range versus kind of what's maybe optimal for the best outcomes in the long term as well. But reference ranges are really based on population norms. And I don't know about you, but I create mm -hmm. my own yeah. reference ranges um, <laughs> that are more so fit for uh, performance. And so to keep you away from the, the trends. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something yeah. that, you, you know, Inside Tracker does really yeah. well is you talk about what's normal versus what's optimized. Right, right. Yeah. And there isn't a point in there necessarily that can be optimized for you, but definitely within the normal, the clinically normal range, there probably is a much smaller range that is better for you. Um, and that might be dependent on, you know, your age, your sex, um, your, um, your ancestry, et cetera. So, 
When it comes to Alzheimer's disease, one thing that we know is that blood flow, or let's just take brain health, okay? Blood flow is extremely important. Okay, so what does blood flow do? Okay, blood delivers oxygen and nutrients to the brain. We know that the brain is the most vascular rich organ in the entire body, and it gets blood flow via the blood vessels. We've got arteries, we've got veins, we've got capillaries. What we see in metabolic dysfunction you mentioned is, let's just firstly talk about blood pressure. When we see hypertension, we know that the first thing to go when it comes to the brain vessels is capillaries. They're just one cell thick. They're the first things to go in hypertensive patients. What else do we see? One thing that is what I've seen, and this is like abundantly clear in the literature, is that fluctuations is actually more detrimental to the endothelial lining of these major arteries and oxidative stress mm -hmm. rather than just chronically elevated glucose levels. So maintaining a normal or stable glucose level is of paramount importance. And this is why for us to have adequate supply of blood to the brain ongoing as we age, and especially in Alzheimer's disease patients or even mild cognitive impairment patients, we need to have well-functioning vessels, well-functioning arteries. That's why what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So when you say metabolic dysfunction is extremely prevalent in cardiovascular disease, then that makes sense. The cardio, the vascular system of the cardio system, it's the same as the vasculature of the brain. So that's why I, I strongly believe that measuring your glucose, whether it's through HbA1c, whether you come and do your blood work, that's extremely important as a first step, just to test and measure. And then as a maintenance phase, wearing a CGM or continuously tracking your glucose to look for these trends. So they're not going up, they're not coming down. You need to be able to stabilize that. The only true way of knowing what's happening in your body is through data, ongoing data. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think you bring a really good point about the mechanism of action for both brain health and cardiovascular disease is that it's, there's a term called glucotoxicity, where too much glucose in the bloodstream is literally toxic. And as you mentioned, those endothelium, they're very fragile. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a thin layer of skin, a thin layer of cells that is covering that endothelium. And when we see a large glucose spike, so either, you know, one-time glucose spike or those fluctuations all day, it's damaging that layer of the yeah. endothelium. And then the body needs to repair that. And when that happens every once in a while, this is why I always like to emphasize every once in a while is not a big deal because the body is amazing. It has repair mechanisms where it can come in, it can clean up that damage and it can, you know, it looks like nothing ever happened. But that creates some inflammation and it mm -hmm. does, it's essentially like, you know, you get a cut on your skin and your body repairs it. You get a scab, there's some inflammation, but eventually you might not ever know that that was there. But if we're doing this every day, if you're having these big fluctuations in glucose levels or these large glucose spikes and you don't realize it, then we start to accumulate more damage than our body can essentially clear out. And that's when we start to see that chronic inflammation. We start to see uh, damage to the endothelium long term, which leads to things like atherosclerosis and then, you know, poor blood flow to the brain. And a lot of people don't realize that that's what's happening and it's not just diabetes that we're putting ourselves at risk for. Yep. So how, I mean, actually, I would love to talk about, and you're a great person to answer this, how much, how big, how often? Because what if you're looking at somebody, and this is honestly the case for me, where glucose, fasting glucose, insulin, HbA1c, all fine. Um, you know, I wore the CGM. I love CGMs. I think they're totally fascinating. I learned a ton of things about how I eat and how I move and how it, you know, how everything affects these, these spikes, but how normal is my normal, right? Mm -hmm. Like, should I be really concerned about a 40 point increase because I ate an apple? And even if I did do that once a day for the rest of my life, first thing in the morning, even though I know I should probably pair it with you know, a fat or a protein now, but before that I didn't, but is that really going to cause Alzheimer's later on? I know that's an impossible question to answer when, but when everything else is kind of looking pretty good, how worried do we need to be about these spikes and how hard do we have to try to keep that, like kind of that flat? Uh, well, from my perspective, mm -hmm. and then you can like, you know, sure. follow it. Nothing, you can't say definitively that one factor is going to cause a disease. Okay, so 
Alzheimer's. We know that we've got so many different things that will lead you to that state, you know, which is, you know, you first go into mild cognitive impairment, which is a pre-dementia state, and then you move into these neurodegenerative states. One thing alone doesn't cause it. However, what we do know is that biology is just like a cycle, okay? So you could have fluctuations in blood glucose. This may increase stress, inflammation, oxidative stress, that may then lead to you maybe having a poor night's sleep. You know, we know that rises in, in cortisol may damage the effects of sleep latency. Maybe you'll have, you know, you're too stressed to fall asleep um, at night. That then goes into maybe you're waking up throughout the night. And we can actually measure glucose throughout the night and cortisol throughout the night as well. So then that lack of sleep will then move into waking up and then you'll have even more of a detrimental effect on your blood glucose as you wake up. And we know that sleeping is, you know, sleep deprivation is massively implicated in mild cognitive impairment. That then will drive you to maybe not go to the gym and work out because you don't have the drive, you don't have the motivation, plus you're tired. And we know that uh, exercising and, you know, increase in muscle size is, you know, muscle is like a glycogen storage bank. Mm -hmm. So the more muscle you have, the better it is because glucose can be stored in that muscle. So then you're also preventing yourself from preventing, you know, these yeah. glucose spikes. It's so it's a, a, it's a it is this effect. cycle. Yeah. So it's not just one thing. And that, I think that's what we really mm -hmm. need to understand. Yeah, absolutely. You, you could put yourself on a positive yeah. flywheel or a negative flywheel. Um, and this is why I think it's so important to have that comprehensive view to your point is that you have to look at everything together. And that's also, trends over time are more important than everything and together in one snapshot. So if we see that everything looks amazing and this one area is maybe suboptimal, that's a much different story than if everything's pointing in the wrong direction or everything is looking suboptimal. So I think context is important and trends over time are important. But then to your question of like how big of a spike, how many is too that's many. That's what everybody wants to know, it's, right? And it's <laughs> a hard question to answer because the research on that specifically is so nascent. Because historically we've used these devices, you can only measure truly your peak glucose value and that glycemic variability or the swings with the CGM. Mm -hmm. um, and we've historically only used them on type 1 and type 2 diabetics. Uh, so we know for them what, what are optimal ranges in order to manage a condition. And we're learning now what are optimal, optimal values in order to prevent conditions. And so we have to go off of um, maybe some evidence that is not perfect because it's lacking a little bit. Um, I have a feeling 10 years from now we're going to have much, maybe, maybe actually a lot less than 10 years, we're going to have much clearer answers. What we know now is based off of population level. So um, there are studies where you put CGMs on thousands of non-diabetics who are, you know, all of their health metrics are in optimal ranges and just observe where do they, where do their glucose values tend to go. Of course, that doesn't tell us definitively that if it's above that, that means a disease state, but it tells us when people are in good metabolic health, this is where their glucose usually is. Mm -hmm. And for most people, we see it below between the ranges of 70 to 140 milligrams per deciliter throughout the day um, for the kind of those healthy, optimal population. So we know that's at least like relatively normal. And then there are some research um, studies that are looking specifically at oral glucose tolerance tests. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you chug a bunch of sugar and then we see what happens to your glucose levels and sometimes you can measure insulin along with it. And from those research studies, we can get some indication of what outcomes are associated with those higher postprandial values. Um, and we know that when you start to even get that one hour postprandial glucose above 155 as a threshold where we see um, a significantly higher amount of inflammatory response, essentially. So you can assume from there that that's starting to get to, okay, maybe we're really pushing the bounds of what the body has to work at to kind of regulate after this. And then, you know, up to 180 is significantly more. And then a random glucose value above 200 is a sign of type 2 diabetes. So we know we've really kind of gone pretty high there. And then how often is too often? Um, what we go off of and what we've learned is that if it's happening on a daily basis, it's probably more than I'm comfortable with as kind of a clinician in this space, um, especially if it's a part of your regular routine. If this is what you eat every single day, your go-to breakfast is sending your glucose to 160 every morning, it's probably worth making some swaps around that, optimizing that meal so that your day-to-day -day routine is more stable values. Whereas, 
if it's your birthday and you're like, I'm eating whatever and your glucose went to 160, I really don't care. You yeah, know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, have yeah. fun, enjoy it, be <laughs> intentional. Um, but it's kind of that regular repeated behavior, the daily use that I'd really like to see it below 140 for most people. That's why it's so useful to actually have a CGM and find out what's going on in there. Exactly, because there's a lot of hidden ingredients too. Um, there are so many things that you think you're making a good choice, you're well-intended. Um, that well-intended individual that is maybe like, you know, the choice isn't as good as what they think it is, that is the kind of information that they really deserve to know. You know, they, I believe that humans should be able to be advocates for their own health. They should be able to have access to this information so that they can have the personal responsibility to make their best decisions. If you choose yeah. to be like, you know what, I'm doing it anyway, then that is that's that is what it is. But if you don't know and you think you're making a good decision, that's where we really need to be data-driven so that we can make the trade-offs and make those decisions in the moment. It's just like wearing a heart rate monitor. That's exactly. what I give all, yeah, all, exactly. all, all my clients. You know, it, it's the exact same thing. And in fact, since wearing mine, I've, I've become so much smarter and so much more aware. For example, I did not realize this, but pineapple, you know, has my CGM beeping at me. You know, it, it's shooting up to like 180. I didn't even know that. Yeah. Fruit is like, fruit is wild. I, I did a Sunny D versus, mm. I think it was either blueberries or an apple challenge. And the fruit actually spiked me more than Sunny Day did. Yeah. What's really interesting and unfortunate, like fruit has a lot of nutrients. Fruit is, can be healthy. But a lot of the fruit we eat today in our grocery store does not resemble like what fruit looked like hundreds of years ago. You know, we've really manipulated our modern day fruit, especially some of the more popular varieties like apples. Um, we've manipulated them to be sweeter, bigger, you know, more devoid of nutrients, less fiber. So they've really actually changed over time to become a little bit more like candy. Yeah. <laughs> so especially some of, uh, you know, certain type of fruit are a little bit, um, more manipulated than others and are going to be really glycemic. And that's why it can be helpful to kind of have it in moderation, know which ones you respond best to, and pairing it with some protein and fat so you're not just kind of having this really easily digestible carbohydrate source. So I'm extremely, extremely interested in the last decade of my life, whenever that may be. We, we never know what that is. However, I'm doing everything I can from the knowledge that I've gained over the last 10 years in the medical and the science field I'm doing everything I can to slow the progression of a lot of these disease states that end up happening to us in the last decade of our lives. So since I know that metabolic dysfunction is at the root cause of many of these diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, some cancers, and of course, cardiovascular disease, I'm doing everything I can to starve that off. And I know that, you know, I'm, I'm fairly young, I'm in my early 30s, uh, if you call that young. Mm -hmm. And I know that I've got, I, I, I've got a lot right now that I can you know, pull on in my wheelhouse you know, to stop the 10 year mark from happening. So managing blood glucose is of paramount importance for overall brain health, uh, female health, uh, and cardiovascular disease wise, but also marrying that with blood work to understand, okay, what's my baseline measurements? What are we working with now? And using things such as heart rate monitor, CGMs to more so maintain that. Yeah. What got you interested in that last 10 years? Just knowing that we have control over mm. it to an extent. We do. Yeah. And I didn't really understand that until I started publishing you know, and working on you know, studies for Alzheimer's disease. And when you work on this, you know, currently working on the correlation of resistance training and uh, Alzheimer's disease. So that's what I, I'm really looking at. And when you look at the d research on that, you really do realize that, oh my gosh, we have so much power over our own lives and how we age. Yeah. Um, so my interest in health, I, first I got interested in health at a very young age. And then I it kind of found my way to metabolic health specifically within that. Um, but growing up, my dad had ALS. So um, this is, you know, a chronic condition that is, you know, you can't do much about it. And it's not very in your control of how you get it. 
Uh, so growing up, I saw the suffering that comes with that and the pain that comes with that when your health is taken away from you. So at a young age, even though he couldn't have done anything differently to not get that condition or to um, you know, survive it, it is something that ends in unfortunately um, you know, passing away. Uh, I learned from that though that there is so much we can do about our health. And so that really sparked my passion for taking control of your health. Uh, because I think if anyone gets an injury, if anyone has anything happen to them, you realize how important health is as the core foundation of you being the best version of yourself. So showing up for people in relationships, showing up at work, you know, showing up for the activities you love, you can't do it if your health isn't optimal. And then I learned that vast majority of these conditions are actually preventable. So that is what led me down the path of nutrition, becoming a dietitian, really being passionate about health. And then I started my career in the hospitals, um, working with patients in the clinical setting, mostly ICUs. And it was not very helpful. <laughs> so I wasn't able to help people in the way that I wanted to. Um, that, you know, health healthcare system is great for acute care, acute issues, but it's not great for prevention or, you know, kind of actual health or addressing some of these long-term conditions. So I got very frustrated with my lack of ability to help people in the way that I was looking for. So I eventually left traditional healthcare and kind of you know, started my own solution instead. And the reason I got to metabolic health is because I really wanted to find the thing that followed kind of that 80-20 rule. What can we focus on that's going to make the biggest impact overall. When I'm digging into the re research, I had no kind of agenda or bias at that time. It really pointed to metabolic health as this is the thing that if we can put this, your metabolic health in an optimal place, then it's going to have this positive ripple effect overall. We're going to see these positive health outcomes um, in almost every aspect. And so that's really where I got interested and it's kind of the foundation of health and a good place to start. My mom passed away of pancreatic cancer. We mm. don't know if it was actually sporadic or I always wonder yeah. if lifestyle played a part in it. And um, one of the risk factors for pancreatic cancer is actually smoking. Um, my mother smoked for 30 years, but she had quit for maybe 20 years before she was diagnosed. Like really, it was pretty exceptional. So, um, but she also didn't really have the greatest diet, but uh, we never put a CGM on her. Um, so I don't really know how things were going in there. Um, but I definitely think about that too. Like, were there any lifestyle factors that could have contributed to that? Um, definitely have a family history of vascular disease. Um, I have an elevated genetic risk uh, for type two diabetes mellitus, uh, elevated risk for gaining weight um, and, um, uh, elevated lipids run in my family, although nobody seems to have died of a heart attack or anything like that, there is some vascular disease. So I know already that this is an area of concern for me. Um, and I have always loved data and tracking whatever I can. Like we're all, we're all <laughs> total self-experimenting data nerds here. Um, I've tracked my lipids ever since my early 20s, and those are something that just slowly and steadily rose. Mm -hmm. And they were already kind of borderline elevated to begin with. But, you know, there was really no solution for that, right? When you waltz in and you're like 23 and everything's fine, but your LDL is like hovering around 135, they're like, eh, whatever, you know, try incorporating some more avocados. And I did make dietary changes. They made no effect. Um, had no impact whatsoever, really. So I stopped making dietary changes that were restrictive. I tried to keep the ones that were okay. Um, but honestly, I know that it's something that could be coming for me. And the way that I think about this is that it's um, actually my trainer says this. He's like, it's a three legged stool of rest um, and nutrition and exercise, right? And the way I look at it, at it is that, at least for me, exercise is really fun. I love it. Any kind of movement. Awesome. So that's easy. I can check that box off. Um, suck at rest. Absolutely. <laughs> I've been working really hard at that. But I also kind of suck at nutrition because I will do despicable things for sugar. I love sugar. Um, and I know that that's kind of like my last area to work on. So... Um, 
That's why I'm actually super excited to have had access to a CGM and I tried NutriSense, I've tried other ones, I found them really valuable. Um, I also found it really valuable to have my insulin measured because I did have a sense of my fasting glucose and it was okay, but I was convinced that I was one of these people where the canary in the coal mine was screaming or like, you know, the little boy was crying wolf or whatever. I, my insulin's actually fine, but I was super relieved to find that out. I didn't know that until actually just a few months ago when we started, when we incorporated it inside Tracker. But I don't know, I'm very happy to have all of this information and it's kind of like what you say where any choices I make now, like they're educated choices that I'm making, right? I know I know exactly what I need to do and now I just need to do them. And that's another whole topic we could talk about is how hard it is to um, implement the lifestyle changes that you want. And I actually think we do a terrible job of like pointing at people and being like, you're not doing it right because you're not strong enough or something like that when really yeah. it's like society has totally set you up to fail, but another topic. Um, but yeah, that's, I don't know. That's where I am. Um, so far, so good, but definitely worried about these things in the future. Both of my grandparents, I watched them die with dementia, and it sucks. You know, it really just... Um, the Yeah, this whole pancreatic, that's how my grandmother went, and that's how my auntie, my mom's sister went. So ever since then, I have just been, like, adamant with my mother yeah. about... Uh, screening. Yes. And even yeah. though, it, you know, you can get all the tests and really, I mean, I'm not sure. I don't know if you can weigh on this. I don't know if, like, even if you do an MRI or a CT, can it really pick up on pancreatic tumors to the point where you can get it removed? Not really. I mean, That's unless I mean. it's already a centimeter or so large. Um, and at that point, so you that's don't what really I mean. want that happening. So with that said, um, they are starting to do more pancreatic cancer screening. Um, I actually don't qualify for it. Mm. Um, although my doctor was like, if you have a lot of heartburn, let me know and we could order some imaging. I'm like, thanks. Just say you have heartburn. But there's but. also more genomic tests out there. So there's a test from Grail, the Galeri test. And one of, I think that pancreatic cancer is on their list and it looks at circulating tumor DNA. Yeah. Um, and the accuracy with which it can diagnose you is kind of increases depending on what stage of hidden cancer you may have. So, you know, early stages are harder to detect than later, but um, I'm sure a lot of the more metabolically related cancers are on that list too. Yeah. But I do think that's important. Pancreatic is, is on the list of the higher correlation, pretty much anything that touches the GI tract. Yeah. You know, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, um, I can't even think of any of the other ones right now, but uh, pancreatic cancer is definitely on the list for highly correlated with metabolic conditions. Yeah, the other risk factor, I think, sense. in one big like epidemiological study was consumption of juice. Makes sense. So like, yeah. What do you think is something that a lot of people don't realize or common misinformation out there? Huh. There is so much. There, it, we're, we're, I think it's an epidemic right now, social media, where there is just so much information, mm -hmm. first and foremost, like, you know, that the general population who doesn't have a scientific background or a medical background may be thinking, you know, what path do I choose when it comes to my health? And when you do know the science, you do know the, the scientific literature, you know what's real and what's not. And I think what is really important is to understand, first and foremost, that it, biology is not a recipe to follow. And you have to understand what's happening in your body. You have to, the only way to really understand that is one of the best ways actually is through blood work. And the one thing I love about blood work is it doesn't discriminate. You, it's offered all over the world, okay? And it is a true measurement. It's not an opinion. So once you do the blood work, it then becomes about the interpretation. And so I always say, blood work, it doesn't matter who takes it. A phlebotomist can take it. It doesn't need to be a doctor per se. Anyone can take your blood. Who's interpreting your blood work? And when it comes to blood work, that's something that's really interesting is that a single biomarker doesn't really matter. You could have elevated LDL, that's great. What really matters is ratios. So for example, LDL to HDL ratio and trends. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at, okay, this may be your LDL. It's fine right now. You are within reference range. However, 
in 10 years, you are going to be in that cardiovascular yeah. disease risk. So you need to understand as well how to pick up on trends. Now, if you don't know that, and the general population doesn't, you, know, you don't need to know that, of course, but if you're turning to social media and you're following the latest Instagram influencer and they're telling you to do X, Y, I hear the craziest thing. For example, the craziest thing I'm hearing is regarding water and that water is alive. I'm not even going to go there right now. And so people are now even being scared to drink water, for God's sake. So that's the first thing that we need to realize. Does it replicate? Like, how is it alive? We, we actually have to go into this. <laughs> I'm actually not sure. I, I posted about this saying, um, you know, you, know you, you don't know. You know it's just, just drink the water, for yeah. God's sake. Because we even know that even a mild drink, decrease you know. in, uh, in the amount of water you have, you know, it, hydration is extremely important. For, for many, many, many reasons. For many reasons <laughs> that people don't even, so just drink the water. <laughs> However, you know, there's a, a, there's a growing um, concern around this fake thing called adrenal fatigue. And I have to say that if your practitioner is telling you that you have adrenal fatigue, then get a new one because that's another form of misinformation. You know, if you are chronically fatigued, you can test that through a blood test. And not many people know that. They turn to things such as sugar caffeine, which is just going to rise your cortisol, which is going to end up making you more fatigued. And just measuring your adrenals, which is really, you can do that through an electrolyte status. You know, we, we know that if you're going to measure the adrenal glands, you're really measuring aldosterone and you're measuring how much sodium and potassium you have and looking at the relationship between those two, which will give you, you know, a, a dysfunction, you know, a, a reading of, yes, you are, your adrenal is in dysfunction right now. But so I think, you know, just understanding where the science is coming from, that's what, that's what I, I truly believe. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. And then the aspect, too, of just these, like, bold blanket statements. Um, you know, that is what gets clicks. That's what, you know, is exciting and sexy, but it's not actually that helpful. Uh, so I always know if somebody is dead set on, like, one dietary approach or, like, one way of eating and that's what they're selling, that they are not working with real people. Uh, because anybody who works with patients, clients, customers, anyone can see that there is so much variability between people and you really have to personalize it. I have seen, you know, like a, a keto diet done well, that's nutrient dense and has a variety of nutrients work really, really, really well for some people. And then somebody else who looks just like that person, same gender, same age group, you know, same weight, it works horribly for them and they don't enjoy it. So you also have to take into account preferences and what somebody's going to be able to stick to. Um, but there really is this no one size fits all approach, in my opinion. And when somebody is like dead set on this is like the one best way to eat or never do this thing, always do that thing, um, then I think that that's a big a red flag it should go off on your head because there has to be this personalized element. We're, we're very different amongst people. People don't understand that in order to reach a certain biological state, whether that's you know peak human performance, which is the area I work on, what I see first and foremost is if I can get my clients to focus on two things, that is adherence and consistency, mm -hmm. <laughs> that will produce the biggest benefits of health rather than saying, uh, you know, you just need to eliminate X, Y, and Z. You know, we can eliminate a, at least a thousand calories in somebody's diet, just not by completely taking out things, but by modifying it. Yeah. Instead of having, you know, the bacon and the cheese and the this and the that for breakfast, let's substitute it for something else. Instead of having ice cream at night, let's just substitute that for fruit. So we're moving al along, you know, in a Absolutely. consistent manner. Yeah. If we don't know everything about biology, mm. right? Like that's, like as a biologist, <laughs> it is, I consider it like space exploration, basically. Yeah. Like we know so much more than we did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, but we're still like, we still only understand a fraction of what there is out there. There are layers of regulation that we haven't even discovered yet, right? Like it's incredible. And we thought that like we would just actually we'd sequence the genome and then we would know everything. Well, we did and we don't. And then, you know, now we're working on the epigenome, but it is so incredibly wildly complex. And that's why it can be so hard when you just want a black and white answer. And I've been on both sides of that equation. Sometimes I want the black and white answer. I'm like, are my peaks bad? Yeah. Are they? Tell me, Kara. <laughs> right? How many do I need to have? Like, how many peaks? How many peaks? <laughs> Tell me. But um, at the same time, I know that it is, it is like you have to, you have to, 
you have to do both. You have to see the big picture, you have to be able to zoom in, but that consistency is key and we're still learning. So I really also hope that like people can be patient with us scientists that are, are still figuring it out. And, um, you know, my feelings about a scientific topic may entirely change a year from now. And that's okay. Like that yeah. to me is a green flag when people can just say like, okay, well, I made this decision based on that information, but now there's new information now. But everybody is different and it is not just the preferences, but there are so many reasons why things work or don't work and we still don't even understand why, Yeah. right? Like most drugs don't have a 100% hit rate and it's not, I, we, sometimes we just don't know, right? Mm. Like, yeah, and, and I think it comes down to a skilled practitioner to understand two things. You've got one side where you're collecting the data. That's the science, okay? Yeah. We can go and get the blood test done. The blood test, you know, may reveal, you can do 500 different biomarkers, okay? We've got those, that's great. But we also need to understand, and this is what a really good practitioner does, and this is through a, a really thorough intake form. You know, at Neuroathletics, our intake forms just decode the entire person's psychological state. And these, the, the, the psychology is what's driving the data. So you can have a, an elevated CRP, which is a measure of stress, let's just say. But I want to know, why is that stress so high? Is it food? Or are you, are, you, you know, are you angry? Are you mad? Are you going to bed? Like, what is driving you to have that? Like, what are you doing to tell your body that you have high cortisol first thing in the morning? Because we can do cortisol levels throughout the day as well through saliva. So we can check that. So why are you getting stressed at 2 p.m.? What is it work? Are you that? So you have to marry the two. And that's, you know, that's not what we're seeing on social media. We're seeing, oh, you've got, you're stressed or you've got high cortisol jump into the ice bath. That'll cure everything. Until it's alive and it eats yeah. you. <laughs> no, totally. And I also think that that kind of brings another point that we've been talking about a lot. A lot of times the best thing is kind of boring, right? Totally and, agree. <laughs> you know, we just, um, one of the most like vilified recommendations at Inside Tracker is also our most popular, and that is to consume more olive oil. Um, and everybody hates it. They're like, yeah, I know. I'm like, right, but are you consuming more olive oil? Are you, right? And you can't, you can't have something be like really novel and also science-backed. Like it's literally the definition of science-backed is not novel. Like we've already learned about it. The New York Times have written about it. But, you know, the real question is like, are you actually taking that into consideration? Are you bringing that into your life? Like we all know exercise is good for you, but lots of people don't do it. Mm. And that's cool. Like we can maybe figure out other ways of movement, but... Sometimes the best answer is just a little boring, and I think that's hard yeah. right now, especially and with social media. One last thing that I'll add is that when it comes to exercise specifically, everybody is training for something different. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to be following uh, people on Instagram because everyone is just, you know, when it comes to exercise, everyone's training for something different. I know this person may look good and they're doing the, the booty crunches, whatever they call them, the things that just don't work on me. Um, they may look good, but they may be training for something different. You don't need to train for a marathon. You don't need to be working out. You don't need to be doing CrossFit three hours a day if you're just training for general health. That's why it's so important to understand who are you, what do you want to do, what are you training for, and get about the business of doing that. 100%. It needs to be through the lens of, of that individual. And it needs to be data-driven, as we're mentioning, because there are so many unknowns. And that's where a good practitioner also is going to have nuance, and they're going to admit when it's like, we don't completely know. Or let's try this, and let's see how it goes, and let's be data-driven. And that's um, where I always recommend, what I like to teach people is frameworks, rather than give them like specific black and white solutions. So it's frameworks of thinking about how to improve your health. So it's it's getting the information but then being malleable so try something and then retest you know work on one thing at a time talking about behavior change and like habit stacking um, so it's that ability to kind of be your own mini scientist and for some people that comes naturally and for others you might have to teach it but that's really kind of the best approach to see those good long-term outcomes and then the only things that you can actually tell people black and white are the are the basics the fundamentals the things that 
are just true and they're boring. They're, you know, everyone's like, oh, we know. Like, they're like, what's the one thing I can do that's most important with nutrition? It's whole foods, minimally processed as possible. And everyone's like, okay, uh, cool. Yeah. But I'm like, really, else. do that and you're probably like gonna be pretty well off. There's a lot of little things that we can do when we get your biomarkers, when we look at the lab work um, and we experiment and we, you know, follow your trends. Um, but there's still the fundamentals that are true for everybody. And those are the things that, you know, aren't necessarily flashy. I think as a good rule of thumb is if you are following somebody that gives you the antidote to a, a disease, for example, I have seen um, some people on YouTube giving cures for cancer. Uh, I think they're the people that we need to be, you know, really cautioning against. Yeah. On the concept of tracking, um, we have two aspects, right? We can zoom in with something like a CGM where we're looking in real time at one biomarker very carefully, and you can do these beautiful real-time end of one experiments. Um, and then we have something more like Inside Tracker, which is um, more of a zoom out because it's measuring a lot of things, um, but less often in terms of blood tests. Um, you can, of course, look at fitness trackers, which will also give you some real-time data as well, but um, both of them have amazing advantages. I know that we're both, we're all fans of being able to do everything really, as much data as possible. Um, on the zoom out, you know, one of the things that I've found to be really helpful is to find the focus areas that I need to work on for myself or that I've noticed in looking at other people's data. Um, and usually, you know, most people aren't completely haywire on every spectrum, whether it's their metabolic health, uh, their inflammatory state, their sleep state, um, their you know, endurance capacity, et cetera. But there really are a few focus areas. So um, what I've found helpful for myself is identifying those focus areas. I know mine in general tend to be things like the lipids, um, also iron and what happens because my iron levels tend to go up and in and out of range um, depending on what I'm doing for exercise and what my diet is is looking like around that period of time um, but yeah I would love to talk about longitudinality um, I do think that the most fun thing to do in the world is an end of one experiment on yourself so you have that ability to say, all right, you know, maybe I am going to try eating oats in the morning and seeing if that impacts my LDL. That's actually the experiment that I did try many years ago. I, you know, I ate oatmeal every day. I incorporated avocado. I started eating fish. Like I really kind of swapped out the bad oils for the good oils, uh, limited my saturated fat intake. And then I could really see after that whether there was an impact or not. And there isn't always an impact and many times there is. So another great, like I've noticed that my resting heart rate has gone down ever since I started running, right? There's like a very clear trend if I, if I look at my fitness tracker data that I can see that happened like two years ago after I started running, which was amazing. So just some examples like that would be amazing to talk about that you guys have. Yeah, absolutely. And how often do either you personally or do you recommend to your customers to kind of retest all of those if you are experimenting and making changes? I mean, in general, we recommend maybe once a quarter, so once every three months. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it has been really helpful. I would say that, you know, I made two major medical decisions based on those long-term trends. I think maybe we talked about them a little bit, but recently I did go on a statin and I started HRT. Um, mostly for cardioprotective reasons. And I was never really in the red zone um, in terms of the lipids, but they were starting to creep up as I got older and older. And it was very helpful. Actually, I saw um, a female preventive cardiologist who's focused on women's health. And she looked at that trend over time. And it was that where she was like, that's actually what is concerning. And that's the reason why we should put you on a low dose statin. And, you know, Inside Tracker is not a medical product. It's not really used to diagnose anything. Um, but she found that data to be really helpful that I gave to her to be able to make that really big decision. But if I hadn't had that longitudinal look um, and hadn't been kind of tracking it as carefully as I had been, she wouldn't have been able to come to that decision as quickly. Yeah, I think what's also, we actually recommend uh, every four to five months as well, just doing a, a general blood test because it takes a long time to change a status. Like, for example, hormones, if you're vitamin D, even, for example, it, it, it takes a long time 
through the metabolic pathways to increase vitamin D once we figure out, first and foremost, what is the reason you are deficient in the first place. And the only way to, you know, to measure what you're doing is via these blood tests. So we know that. But that time in between is what I think is really, you know, really beautiful because we need to figure out from so many different, we need to pull from every data point we have. For example, I wear a CGM, you know, I, I, I use NutriSense and then I'm also wearing um, an aura ring so I can track and measure my HRV. And so I'm, I'm pulling from so many different data points. So then when I go back and do my blood test, and I see a change, I can figure out that's because I've been sleeping more, my HIV's increased, uh, I, I've, I've optimized my diet because I know what works for me and what doesn't. For example, personally, like I mentioned to you, like grapes and, um, and pineapple, like terrible for me. But for some reason, dark chocolate is great or even, you know, 60 to 7% chocolate doesn't do that bad for me. So you can measure that and you can't optimize what you don't measure. Yeah. So that's where I think you've got to marry the two, just like with the art of you know, questioning and then the science of biomarkers, you've got to marry the two always. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I like the frequency of every quarter, every six months, depending on how much you're changing, you know, how much is in flux. I think that the traditional approach of once a year, if that, you know, a lot of people aren't even doing once a year. If I can get you to do once a year, I'm going to be happy about that. But once a year is often not often uh, frequent enough. Um, what we would typically see in traditional healthcare setting is, you know, you get labs once a year and it's like, oh, you're in the pre-diabetic range, you know, change, change what you eat, exercise a little more and I'll see you in a year. Whereas that's the perfect time to be doing something more frequently, you know, making those changes, tracking exactly what things you change, retesting in three months, see what direction it went. And that's where the point of trends is also so important. Um, you really, you know, you can't manage what you don't measure. And we're all also business women. You know, this is applicable to all areas of life. If you're running a business and you don't have KPIs, you don't have success metrics, you're not looking at any of your financials, you're probably not going to run the business very well. You know, you can't go off a gut feel. It's the same with your health. If you're just assuming kind of the things you're doing are working for you, but you're not measuring anything, you're just kind of going off a gut feel, you're probably not going to be in the place that you want to be to actually see the outcome you want, which is to feel amazing. Um, so I think tracking, you know, trends over time will tell you that story of, is this still not optimal, but you've brought it down a lot, and so we're moving in the right direction? Or, you know, for 10 years it looked good, and now only in the last year it's going in the wrong direction. What did you do differently? Can really tell a much more rich situation than just those random snapshots in time. Uh, I, it reminds me of a, an analogy that I like to um, that I like to say, and it's like you you treat your body or your health like a business, okay? Your KPIs are the, you know, you're pulling from the CGM, from the Aura Ring, from the Whoop, and then you have your, your quarterly board meeting, which is the, um, <laughs> which is the, the blood work, and the blood work is going to determine yeah. whether your KPIs have been met. I love that, I'm stealing that, yeah. <laughs> Let's trademark that. <laughs> One thing I would actually love to hear from you is, What's a fantastic success story for somebody, let's say, that was in the pre-diabetic or even in the diabetic range who was just really able to rein it in after being able to watch their glucose in real time? Yeah, and we, we see this all the time. We see a lot of people who are frustrated because they care about their health and they want to do the right thing, but they get that kind of message where it's like, oh, you know, just eat a little bit better and I'll see you in a year, where that's actually the moment where we wanna be like, all right, let's, let's do everything, let's pull all the stops and let's keep rechecking. And so a lot of people find us at NutriSense because they care and they're like, I don't know what to do, I don't know the right information. And so maybe you know, they have this pre-diabetic value, they've been generally healthy all their life, uh, maybe they have a family history of diabetes, and then they wear the CGM, which is again, kind of more that zoomed in approach, maybe you got the hemoglobin A1C that's kind of on that threshold, and now you're going to know a whole host of information you wouldn't know with just that snapshot. That snapshot gave you the information to do something, um, but now we can really zoom in and look at how, how are you responding to meals? What is that glycemic variability, you know, those swings throughout the day? How high is your glucose going? All of this new information you wouldn't know otherwise. And then you also get to see not only trends in that long-term scale, but trends in that really short-term scale. 
because your fasted glucose could be 100 20 one morning and 80 another morning. Um, and so then we can really look, what did you do differently between yesterday and today? And now, you know, talk about the most exciting thing in the world being N of one experiments, you can iterate so quickly. Yeah. So the speed of which you can figure things out is so much faster. And that really helps build engagement and builds actually, you know, sticky habits that really drive behavior change. Because now it's not, I think this is working, and maybe you know there's some drop off, but it's whoa! I went on a walk after my meal, and that really worked. I'm sticking to that. Like I saw it immediately. Or whoa! That thing, you know, I was eating my instant oats and putting some honey on it and drinking it with an oat milk latte. That shot my glucose really high. Let me swap that breakfast, and now it's stable. My energy levels feel better. You know, I'm functioning better throughout the day too, and you know I'm seeing significantly improved glucose values. So just that ability to experiment and iterate quickly, it builds morale, first of all. And so then you're like, it's not just someone telling me I should do this thing. I, I see it with my own eyes. You know, data is really powerful. Knowledge is power. Um, and so we just see people be able to see results much quicker because they're able to iterate much faster and also be much more excited about it. And now they know, OK, here are the five things that work really well for me. Um, and I'm going to keep doing them forever because I'm seeing that it's working. You know, now my A1C is completely normal or now my PCOS is under control. We've had people who have had PCOS for a long time are now they're really trying to get pregnant. Um, they're having fertility issues. And so they use the CGM, they find out things to manage that, they get their insulin levels down, they get their glucose levels down, and they are able to get pregnant. Like that's an incredible success story. Uh, so it's not just hemoglobin A1C, it's not just prediabetes, diabetes, it's all of those conditions that we are talking about. Sometimes it's brain fog and ability to focus and really you know, be your best self in maybe the work setting or in different um, situations. So we see a lot of really amazing outcomes, but I think it's because it both helps drive those individual responses better. You, know, you figure out what works for you as an individual, and that also gets people motivated and excited and builds those habits where it's like, I, I'm doing this, this is my thing now. And it helps you make intentional trade-offs too. So like we said, life is also supposed to be fun. And like, it doesn't mean that we need to be perfect and we never deviate, but you get to make these trade-offs. So maybe you have a really big glucose spike to pineapple, but you're like, I don't even really like pineapple, it's fine. But maybe pineapple is your favorite thing in the whole entire world, then let's figure out a way to make pineapple work. You know, let's do it if you just worked out or let's eat some protein first. So you can make these intentional trade-offs. And what we see is a lot of people leave with more food freedom than what they expected. You know, you go into it being like, well, now I'm gonna have to get rid of chips and chocolate for the rest of my life. But instead you find the things um, that work for you and how to build them in and you know when it's okay and maybe when it's not as optimal and you can make more um, intelligent and intentional decisions. So I, uh, I can give you a really good case study of a client that I had that came in, um, 49 years old and runs a really big firm here in New York City. He is a hedge fund manager, so he's got a lot of money under asset management. Extremely stressed. We did all the tests for him. Fasting glucose or HbA1c was really, really high. So that was one biomarker amongst many that we wanted to track. Okay? And this was just one specific measurement we did. So we, Inside Tracker, did all the tests. We saw a high HbA1c. And in order for us to manage that, he's a very, very busy man. We got him hooked up to a CGM. And he got to track it. He got on the app and he got to track, you know, what was good for him. This is coming from someone who knows nothing about nutrition. So, and also he's extremely time poor. He had three kids. He had a wife, extremely like busy at work. And he kept saying to me, I don't have the time. So we actually pre-bought his meals for him. So I know not everyone can do that. However, what I found really interesting was the amount of education that somebody who's not in the field of science or nutrition or health was able to garner from a simple you know, metric such as a CGM. Yeah, and that's why I think the data, both um, a lab, pan, you know, a blood 
panel and the CGM is interesting because you can either you can take as little as you want from it and still have a lot of information, or you can be that person that's looking at every single little detail and doing a deep dive on everything. Um, but if you don't want to spend that much time on it, you can pull out like the one most important thing from each. You know, what is the thing that is giving you the highest glucose spike? What is your one like lab value that's least optimized that you want to focus on? Um, and you could just do that thing. You know, you know, make a couple changes that adjust that one thing, and you're going to still see improvements. Yeah. And that's where you know we have um, dietitians who work with our customers at NutriSense as well because that human component, as we know, data alone is not the whole story. You can't just do data. You need to have some education component. Um, our dietitians love when people come in with other labs because it can help pinpoint what is that one thing that we should focus on the most, especially for really busy people. What is your Achilles heel? Mm -hmm. So if you have a blood panel from Inside Tracker and our dietitians get to look at it and we see that the really abnormal thing on there is your cortisol levels and your fasting glucose is high every single night on your CGM, that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna be like, you're never gonna see your outcomes that you're looking for unless we address stress. So let's just think about stress. Yeah. Um, you know, or there's many other examples, but it can help direct what's that one thing to really focus on. Because there are a lot of things that can influence our metabolic health and our glucose levels. Yeah, and one really great thing that we did for him was time-restricted feeding. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is just the window, not, we didn't focus on fasting. We, we just focused on, I just want you to stop eating three hours prior to going to yeah. sleep. And we, yeah, we, it was amazing. And then we retested him and there was a massive difference. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Actually on the Inside Tracker platform, we did recently do an analysis of HbA1c and saw that people that um, fell into the range of 6.5% or greater, we took all of them. And then we looked at their average values, which were around 7%. When they retested, they were back down. That whole population skewed down towards 6.5%. Mm -hmm. It was actually extraordinary. And it made me wonder a couple of things. Like, first of all, was it these lifestyle interventions? Did that just like kind of wake these people up? Did they then go to the doctor and say, hey, wow, look at this? And did they go on medication? I mean, you know, it's, yeah. it's hard to say exactly what it was um, at a population level, but I think it was pretty extraordinary. And in some way, it must have been a pretty big wake, wake up call. And I think a lot of those patients really would have benefited from also having a CGM associated with it. So they could have made those like day to day real time changes in their diet, yeah. which they probably were in some way. But it might have been really fun to see exactly what was happening. Yeah, and I think the more that we talk about this openly, the more people I'm not afraid. You know, I, I, it, I didn't know this existed, but people sometimes are afraid to get blood tests. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that that was a thing. Afraid of the boogeyman, you know, like what's it going to reveal? And I'm scared. And it's like, it's just there just to show you where you're at, just, yeah. you know? Yeah, this is something I talk about often because I do see it a lot. People are afraid to weigh themselves. They're afraid to get their lab work done. They're afraid to look at the data. Um, but ignorance is not bliss, right? Unfortunately, reality is still reality whether you want to look at it or not. The only difference is if you do look at it, then you have the ability to do something about it. And so really getting people to be okay with that, I think part of it is it's scary to see the results and it's also forces you then to have the personal responsibility. If you don't know, then like you didn't know, but if you do know now, it, it's on you to take responsibility. But that's also really empowering. That's super exciting because a lot of these things are malleable. As we've mentioned, we can see them go in one direction. We can see them go in the other direction. Like many labs can fluctuate. And the more often we look at it and the sooner we look at it, the more that we can kind of direct which, which way it's going to go. So um, reminding people that there's actually a lot they can do and feeling that empowerment rather than that fear, I think is really important. It's interesting. I was talking to a physician actually here in New York uh, the other day, and he was saying that um, males in their 20s and 30s often don't go to the doctors. They just don't, you know, and they roll into the doctor somewhere in their 40s and everything's gotten kind of out of control oh, yeah. at that point. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and how that's just a, a huge problem because it's, it's really blinders when you know, a couple of easy choices mm -hmm. that could have been made maybe a decade or two before the die was actually already cast could mm. have been really helpful. So that sounds very doom and gloomy, but I also feel like the answers are usually not as scary as you think they're going to be, right? Like it might just be have peanut butter with your apple. Like that's not that bad, <laughs> right? Like 
I, mm. I can do that. Yeah. Um, and it's so much easier to fix things when, when they're yellow flags yeah. versus red flags, exactly. right? You know, our body is much more adaptable when we haven't kind of crossed into that disease threshold, which there is still a lot you can do if you have type 2 diabetes, if you have cardiovascular disease. So I'm certainly not trying to imply that there's nothing we can do at that point. But the sooner we find it, the sooner we see some of these, you know, warning signs, it's a lot easier to kind of put it in the other direction and start going that opposite flywheel. Yeah, it's the same actually for dementia and Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease because your symptoms only come on 20 years after mm. it's um, you know actually starting, and that's quite scary as well. And by the way, on the on the topic of symptoms, um, everybody should realize that symptoms are the language of the body. Your only way of your body communicating to you that there's something wrong is via a symptom. Symptom is just you know. I have a headache. Yeah. We shouldn't be walking. We should be waking up mm -hmm. every day thriving, mm -hmm. high libido, high happiness, motivated, energized. If you aren't, then we have to talk. Yeah, and I think that brings a really good point where a lot of times pushback I get is that shouldn't we know, like, what's best for us by feeling. And what I have found is that a lot of people have lost touch with yeah. those internal signals, right? And so data can actually enhance that mind-body connection. Because with the example of even just the CGM, you can see, oh, when my glucose shoots up and then crashes down, I have a headache, I feel hungry, I feel tired, I feel the urge to take a nap. So you're starting to reconnect those signals and then eventually maybe you know you don't need that data stream 24-7 yeah. because you've now enhanced your ability to feel those things and know what they mean. And so for many people, we really have completely disconnected from how we feel. And so often kind of we need that objective measure uh, to give us signals, especially with things like stress. Um, you know, many people are like, I'm not stressed. I'm not stressed <laughs> at all. <laughs> and then you measure like, you know, all the different metrics. You look at cortisol, you look at glucose, you look at HRV, and you're like, you're definitely stressed. Your body is in like this complete stress state all of the time. But sometimes normal is normal, yeah. even if it's not normal. Um, so that data can bring really their awareness to what you might be not able to feel anymore. I think that is such an amazing point. And I think about this a lot with running. And I love the Twitter arguments about whether you should just ascertain your effort by RPE or if you should ascertain your effort by using a heart rate monitor. And it's like the... Mm. You know vegans versus the animal meat protein people like there's just it's but i'm like the answer is kind of i don't know you can use it if you want to use it or not but i actually find wearing a heart rate monitor helps me figure out how my body feels if that makes any exactly. sense and then after a while you don't really need the heart rate monitor anymore because it's just helped it's helped you attain to something again, with, yeah. with data which i think makes a lot of sense but i also think it's like we live these really weird artificial lives these days right like we sit under these lamps, we're not outside anymore. We, you know, stare at computer screens all day. Um, that's a new way of living that we have to somehow adapt to. And I don't think it's gonna go away tomorrow unless we can like up and move to the woods. So if data can help you just kind of get back in touch with how you are and what you feel like so you can listen better and maybe figure out when something's gone awry. Um, I mean, a lot of people who are diagnosed with cancer, like when they look back, they're like, oh, Things were kind of off, but I didn't really, I didn't really think about that. I just, I thought like three weeks of diarrhea was normal. Like, no, it's not. You didn't have a cold. Like, you know, there was something going on yeah. there, but you didn't go to the doctor because you got used to it somehow. I don't know. I think it's kind of sad, but. Yeah. I think that we all can agree, we've discussed this, of how important it is of actually making sure that who you're working with can implement consistently the thing that they're doing, right? You can have all the right information and knowledge in the world, but if you don't do that thing consistently, you're not gonna see the outcomes you're looking for. So you might have the perfect routine, but if everything drops off a year from now, then we have no success. So part of actually the reason that drove me to starting NutriSense was that frustration working one-on-one -on -one counseling with patients as a dietitian, um, because they can get excited about the thing, you're educating them, you're talking about it, and then you follow up with them a month later and they're like, I didn't do any of the things that we said we were gonna do, and then you have that conversation again, and it's really frustrating for both of you. You know, it's not very powerful. Um, and what I have found is that data, and specifically even the kind of that continuous data stream is one thing that really helps drive that powerful behavior change um, because 
A, it's increase, increasing what's called intrinsic motivation, right? So like we said, it's not somebody telling you to do something you're seeing with your own eyes. When I make this change, this lab value improves. When I make this change, my glucose data is better. So suddenly it's more motivating to you. You have to find that intrinsic motivation. If it's being externally motivated, if it's I want to lose 20 pounds for this wedding coming up, or my doctor told me I need to do X, Y, Z thing, it's not going to work. So you need to have that intrinsic motivation, and then we also need to have that feedback loop of where we're getting some sort of reinforcement. Um, and you know, we can get that through any of these data pieces that we've been talking about. But often with health behaviors, there's this huge time gap where you do the thing today, you might not get diabetes for 30 years. Or you do that positive thing today, you go to the gym today, and it kind of wasn't that fun and I'm sore and now I don't want to do it anymore. So, you know, we are humans that love immediate gratification. You know, we love the clicks, the likes, the immediate thing. And so part of making behavior change that works is how do we close that time gap? How do we get you to get some sort of reward or consequence much quicker than what might happen naturally? And that's where I think data, you know, modern solutions for modern problems is really helpful because you can see, okay, when I eat, that thing every single night, you know, that piece of cake, my glucose goes really high, and then I don't sleep as well, and then I feel cruddy the next day. So it's, you're getting that immediate feedback, or I go on that walk, my glucose is better, I feel so much better, that immediate positive feedback. And I think that can really drive some of that consistency, which is what we need to see if we want anyone to be kind of successful in the long term. Yeah, and then what we also know is that the biggest levers that are going to push us towards optimal health require some level of consistency and habits. But where I think we're going wrong is in creating those habits. And, you know, with everything you just said, we also know that we, we can just start real small. You know, for, for really metabolically mm -hmm. unfit individuals, I'm talking even at the obese level, just going out and going for a walk is a really big thing, mm -hmm. you know, for their health, but also for them. That walk over the next month may turn into a five day a week walk because they just feel good. They're getting outdoors. They're seeing nature. Their dopamine is rising. They're, they're losing some weight. They're getting their steps in. That walk eventually may turn into, let's just get you to do a wall, uh, a wall squat. Then let's get you to do some walking lunges, just five. That's it. And if you start small and you just reinforce these patterns in your brain through, you know, we all know that adult neuroplasticity exists. Once you start doing something for eight weeks, or even three months, we're going to see a pattern and your brain is just going to be like, okay, today I've got to get up and I have to just do my walk. Then over six months, it, may, it will take a long time and you're right. We are waiting for the instant gratification. How many people are on Ozempic right now? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that may just be, but like, you know, I want that instant gratification. Instead of doing the hard work, I don't want to go and do the hard work. I just would rather get liposuction or, or go on Ozempic. But it takes time, health takes a long time to move the needle. It's not, a, uh, it's not just something that's gonna happen overnight. I love all of those points and could not agree more. And I especially love to hone in on the, it doesn't have to be huge, like to create habit. I think a lot of times we see what we want to be in the future and it is this picture of perfection, right? And so many things need to happen to get there, right? And you're setting yourself up for failure if you're going to try to completely rehaul your life in one day. I don't know, sometimes there's a great punch in the face that happens and that might be getting some horrible lab values back that really scare you and shake you into action. Um, recently, I had to spend a couple of days in Europe and actually I used jet lag to help me start to go to bed earlier, uh, right? Yeah. I was like, oh, let me just sort of work off of this because I'm tired now at 9.30 and I'm never tired at 9.30. And it actually really worked. Mm. But so that, that was a great intervention that I was kind of lucky to have. But besides that, I think your, your, your example of a walk is fantastic. And maybe the walk is literally just around the block. Maybe it's not even, maybe it's literally a one minute walk. Like just promise yourself a one minute walk every single day. And then eventually, if you do that for some number of days, you'll find something good in that one minute walk that you just want to latch onto it and then it becomes a two minute walk. But it's that positive, kind of that real time positive affirmation that you really need or else you might get bored or tired of it or find something else to do. And we all have plenty of things to do. So I think 
I think we overcomplicate it sometimes and it has to be really little. And I also think we try to take on too many things at yeah. once. Yeah. So if you're gonna do that one minute walk, like maybe pick one other new thing, but don't pick 10 new things that you're going to try to implement in a day. I'm so guilty of this. I'm totally guilty of it. I want to live like a million lifetimes just to try it all and do it all better. But I find that I drop 99% of those things. But the other thing too is, is accountability and community. Mm. And, you know, I look at, I look at like the people around me and the things that they're doing and that can be really helpful. So for example, I had to get a trainer because I will not lift weights on my own. I just won't. Like, I don't like it. I need somebody to sit there and be like, Renee, do this and then do this now. And there's a set time and I'm not going to cancel. And so that accountability also really helps. And I think, you know, community and surrounding yourself with people who are really supportive yeah. of your goals is so important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to your point, know yourself, um, you know, know whether you're somebody who can do something kind of in moderation or if you're kind of like it needs to be not in the house for me to be, you know, I only eat this thing if I'm out to eat or it can be here, but I only eat it at night. Know yourself because everybody is different. Um, I think that's an important component to understanding all of this as well. And then to your point, I think it's important to shift away from only thinking about weight as the outcome that matters. Because sometimes weight, uh, when we just focus on that and we go on a five minute walk every day and we're like, well, I didn't lose any weight, now suddenly you don't wanna walk anymore. But if we're looking at other success metrics, like how do you feel? What does your glucose levels look like? How are these other lab metrics moving in the right direction? Your blood pressure is probably improving. Mm -hmm. Then you can get these early wins because weight is complicated and weight fluctuates sometimes. And sometimes we have stalls and it can be really slow to lose the weight. Um, so really shifting, I think, of what success looks like to not just be about weight can help you really build momentum as well. That was really good. Um. Um, that, was, that was something that I think was really, I'm noticing now, and especially I have some friends whose kids are just a little bit younger and they're still in that phase. And I'm like, just five more years and you'll just have a lot more time to yourself to be able to pay attention to yourself. So I don't really know how to do it while you're kind of in the thick of things, but I do think that at least I've seen a lot of women just kind of emerge from that and just be like, whoa, like what happened? And I, I don't know how I feel anymore and I don't recognize where I am. And I used to be in a very different place like 15 or 20 years ago and how do I start to reconnect? And I don't know, I think I have no great advice here cause I'm not doing it perfectly. But the one thing that I keep coming back to is those like three pillars, like there's rest and restorative behaviors like sleep and meditation and spending time with friends and like things that just like soothe you or give you energy. And then there is exercise and there is nutrition. And I actually think the easiest thing to do is to start small and start with the thing that is easiest for you, the thing that's most fun for you. And like, just work on that little one thing. And then you can just pick another thing after that because you'll figure it out after a while and then it will become a habit and there you are. So yeah, I would just pick yeah. one, just pick one, one little thing. Uh, for me, when Ever I look at this, you know, and I, I take a helicopter view and I think, how can I best explain this to, to somebody? You know, and if you are in your 40s, in your 50s, and you're at the point of your life where you want to take control of your health, I always say that stop fighting Mother Nature and stop fighting evolution. So I give a great analogy because so many people are looking for that cheat code and they go and take all the supplements because somebody on Instagram told them about this supplement. And yet, they're not exercising mm -hmm. adequately. They're not getting the best restorative, restorative sleep, quantity plus quality, and their nutrition is all off. They haven't built deep and meaningful relationships and most of the population is dehydrated. So one thing I like to say is, yes, go and see where you're at. Marry the, you know, get your blood work, just see where you're at. And then start from the ground up with what mother nature gifted you. Just start with exercise, start with good restorative, restorative sleep and start to eat better. Then you can optimize. You actually cannot optimize unless you've built the foundations first. It's like a pyramid, right? You want to 
you can only stack on top if you've got a solid pyramid underneath. That solid pyramid are Mother Nature's gifts. Mm -hmm. Exercise, sleep, sunlight, healthy relationships, happiness, good nutrition, wholesome nutrition. Once we have that, then you can start to move up that ladder. So it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be strenuous. It doesn't have to be scary. You can, you, you can do it. And I, I'm going to end on saying that there was a Harvard study done. It went over 80 years and it was all based on brain health. They wanted to see these people who lived the longest, you know, who had great cognitive abilities into, you know, when they were centenarians, what do they possess from a brain health perspective? Guess what it was? It was deep and meaningful relationships, mm. not just romantic relationships, you know, having a, a spouse throughout the years, but also cultivating friendships. So I think that, that we, we also need to focus on that as well. I think very well said by both of you. Um, not much to add on top of that, but what I want everyone to realize is how much is in their control. Really feeling that empowerment that our health is in our control and it doesn't have to be overwhelming or scary, right? I think it starts with knowledge is power. You know, getting that information, listening to your body, getting the data, tracking the trends, and then starting simple, doing the things like you said, the basic foundations, stress, sleep, exercise, uh, nutrition, the relationships, all those things are the foundations. But if it feels like all of those are suboptimal, again, pick one, right? Don't get overwhelmed because that's just gonna lead us back into this state of suboptimal health, right? So anything is better than nothing. So figuring out what to start with is whatever is most exciting to you, stack it on top of each other, but know that your health is in your control and there's a lot you can do about it. And we all can feel amazing and vibrant. Like you said, it is normal and it is our right as a human being to wake up feeling amazing, right? We should be able to dream for that and achieve for that and work towards that. So I want people to know that that is possible. Um, I think some people think that that's just like a dream that is completely impossible and I don't believe that is true. Um, but it starts with, you know, knowledge is power and then really just being consistent and doing those foundational, foundational work.